So what is grief? It's an antidote to the serenity prayer. An antidote, not methadone, antidote. It doesn't replace the serenity prayer's function. It doesn't replace an old understanding of control with a new understanding of control. What grief does is essentially let you in for this. The world is bigger than you. The ways of the world are bigger than your decisions and your belief systems about it. And your proper posture uh, in the face of the world is humility, not control. Is taking a knee, not taking more of what you need. So that being the case, you know, the old adage that uh, one of the best way to make the gods laugh is tell them your plans, you know, that kind of thing. So grief, it seems to me, is a kind of skillfulness, not a coping strategy, right? So you can feel all manner of things in the presence of, quote, your grief. For example, joy is utterly compatible with this understanding of what it means to grieve. Because when you grieve, some aspect of that action is affirming life. You know, in its, in its most heart-rending uh, appearances, grief still affirms life and the ways of the world, right? So a formulation that came to me years ago that I'm very fond of and proud of, it goes something like this. I wondered to myself one day, what is the lived relationship between grief and love? Because oftentimes, people, particularly in the throes of real heartbreak, will understand these things to be absolute and polar opposites and hostile to each other. And that, in fact, you craft love so as not to have to grieve. And by the time grief rolls in, it's because it's devastated your capacity to love. Right? So these things are implacable kind of adversaries. I don't think so at all. I think the one is the midwife to the other, in fact. So it could go something like this. Love, you could say, has a relationship to grief that's unsuspected and unsought. And it might be this. If grief is a way of loving that which is, or those who have slipped from view, and I think anybody listening to this could say, well, certainly that's in the mix, that um, grief is a way of loving. It's an expression of love in a fashion. You wouldn't grieve over something that you didn't have a deep running attachment to in some fashion as it slips away. Hmm? So grief is a way of loving. Yes, that which has slipped from view. Got it. You're going to turn this on its head, aren't you? Yes. And I'm going to submit to you that love is a way of grieving that which has not yet slipped from view. But love is whispering to you and grief is whispering to you that that's a time-limited arrangement. That you realize that, be you a Buddhist or not a Buddhist, something about grief is teaching you about the impermanence of things. Even grief itself is impermanent. Right? And that impermanence tempers your understanding of love. That love's not eternal. That the object of your love is not eternal either. And that you are doing all you can to get your love in order now, not only for the heavy weather, but for the end of the weather, for the end of the time that you're allotted to be able to do it. You see? So imagine then that love is an active form of grieving that doesn't require sadness or misery, but it stops you from time to time. I mean, if you have children in the world, I mean, anybody who does knows what I'm gonna say next, that you look at them occasionally, and if you can bear the thought, one of the things you realize is you drag them into this world to die. That's what you did to them. You didn't mean to. You didn't even think of it at the time. You may not even have thought of deliberately making a child in the moment that you did. But all of that's besides the point. And that kid's over there making a fool of themselves as an idiot teenager, whatever they're doing, right? And some part of you is a wash in a kind of bottomless sorrow that's not sad. It's somehow deeper than sadness. It's the most adult version of sad. 
the realization that you've put into motion things that will deliver genuine heartbreak to people that you claim to love. And that's what you did. And it's a package deal. And some part of you wants to take them aside and just apologize. And of course, they'll look at you and say, what? And now I have no idea what you're talking about. Right? And you realize you're in this alone for the time being. They're not old enough to know how sorrowful you become over what you've done to them. See? It's an amazing stew of impossible to resolve things. And if this stuff has its way with you as, it, as you age into your days, your capacity to stand and deliver, informed by this kind of understanding, is really one of the most politically and socially and psychically dangerous powers that a human being can have. The understanding that it won't last. I mean, don't get me wrong, it can go dark. Of course it can. You can decide that nothing means anything, that your attachment to people and to social institutions and so on is irrelevant and meaningless because it's all going to sort of burn away like chaff. You could do that, but there's no grief in that. There's resentment, there's hostility, and grief is gone. But if grief informs your understanding of the impermanence of life, it deepens your attachment to it. It doesn't increase it. It doesn't mean you hold on to it tighter. It means you deepen your capacity to love, knowing how, like dust, Leonard Cohen, my countryman, and He had a Zen monastery, probably not far from where we're sitting. Vows and the whole thing. And as he told the story when he came from the... love you need that was his recipe but if you listen carefully he didn't say a lonelier life becomes greater love you need to get for yourself so you're not so lonely he didn't say that because this is not a solution to loneliness this is a radical act that comes from an understanding of loneliness